to begin with, I'd like to set a couple of ground rules. If you do not have a scriptural refutation of the arguments in this video, don't bother posting a denial. If you just post a denial, I'm going to delete it. You're not going to have it put out there. I, I'm done with answering the trolls and catering to the peanut gallery. I don't care how you feel about this. I don't care what you think about this. I don't care about your opinion about this. The question is, do we have scripture to support our position or not? And I do have scripture to support my position. I'm going to give that to you. But I'm not wasting any more time and letting you guys rob me. I'm doing this, this fourth video on the Satanic Music series to put more nails in the coffin of this sinful music being used and called Christian. So one more time for the cheap seats. If you post a denial, I will delete it. If you want your post to be up here, post an argument that involves scriptures. It's a scripture-based argument, not opinions, not I don't think, not he's ugly, he's old, his breath stinks. I want a legitimate biblical argument, or any other comment is welcome as long as it's on topic. But as far as the trolls, the people that just want to rob me of time, I'm not going to allow denials. Or, I don't, you're wrong. You're just so stupid. We don't have time for that. Okay. Now, in applying, and this video is about directly applying the scripture to this topic, which is simply one of many topics, which you could call subtopics, on the real issue of worldliness, secularism, and, and the church. It's also technically part of a sanctification issue, but we won't go into the sanctification issue. We'll simply talk about scriptures and the biblical separation part. Everyone wants to go directly to David, the easy scriptures, and say, make a joyful noise, or play upon the loud symbols. That, that's not the appropriate scripture. You, you, can't, you can't ignore the rest of the Bible and use a praise song as an, a justification to bring in sinful music into the church. Does it work that way? Um, that would be like taking Jesus out of context where he said, know ye not that ye are gods, little g where he was simply making a statement about the, the spiritual nature of man and the, the Pharisees' sinful um, making of their own Talmud rather than sticking to the law and the commandments God had given them. And so he, he makes this, this statement, taken in context, makes absolute sense. Taken out of context, as the word faith cult does, and saying that everyone's a god is polytheism, it's Mormonism, and it's satanic. So, you can't disregard the rest of Scripture where it identifies that there is only one God, and His name is Yahweh, His name is Yeshua, uh, Jesus, and ignore, I mean, and, and, and ignore all those Scriptures where He says, I am one God, I'm a jealous God, there, is, there were none before me, there'll be none after me, and just go to, well, Jesus said, we're all little gods. That's not a Scriptural argument. That's not proper. So we have to stick to the, the, the fullness of the Word of God and not just take verses like David's Psalms out of context. So let's move on to the proper scripture that you should be quoting in this issue. And we're going to start with Matthew chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. But be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you before ye ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, in just these, these four verses, this little short passage where he's instructing the disciples on how to talk to him, how to pray, we see multiple commandments. We see multiple instructions, and this scripture doesn't apply just to prayer. We, we, this is hermeneutics, this is what your pastor is supposed to be teaching, how to interpret scripture, how to understand scripture, how to take a verse like this and understand that it's talking about three or four issues, and how to apply this verse to specific issues such as heathen, paganism, secular or worldly occultic practices, 
worldly practices is spoken of in this verse. When he says, when ye pray, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. This is a call for biblical separation in here from worldliness. And he explains specifically on this vain repetitions why it's wrong. Now, I'm going to give you from this scripture what is called in logic a syllogism. Now, if you haven't had logic and I get debated by so many or, or scorned and scold, scolded by so many trolls that have apparently no education so they don't understand how to make a logical argument or what a logical argument is. But in logic, we have what are called syllogisms, which are simple, short arguments where we give two premises. A premise is a statement that should be fact-based that supports a certain conclusion. That if all the premises are true and all the premises relate to the conclusion drawn, the conclusion should be valid and true. And that a little aside on logic, your, your, argument, your conclusion of an argument can be valid but not true. And it can be true, but not valid. So you really have to understand the basics of logic. But when you're hearing a logical arg argument from Scripture, it should be valid and true. That is, your, co your premises should be true. Your conclusion should be drawn from those premises. It should relate to them. Therefore, it should be true. It should not be what we would call irrelevant premises. So I'm going to give you a syllogism, which again is two premises with a conclusion that follows. It's an easy way for those of you that took plain geometry and understand how to do a proof. That's all logical arguments are, are proofs. Premise number one. By definition, all praise of God is prayer. Premise number two. Jesus says not to pray to him like heathens. And the conclusion, therefore, heathen music cannot be used to pray to God. Therefore, heathen music cannot be used to praise God. Simple as that. Prayer is praise. All prayer is not praise. All praise is prayer. So we can say that if you're claiming, because I hear constantly this, this objection, well, we're praising God and there's no limit, and we got to be able to praise God in any way, shape, or form. If it's dancing naked and beating and playing heavy metal music and having a... a, a a vile occultic service, that's acceptable because we're praising God. As long as we just say praise Jesus or praise God in there, it must be okay. No, 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 no. All praise of God is prayer. So you can't have that exception anymore. Again, I told you that I was going to drive nails in the coffin with this video. Now, in discussing this issue, like most other behavior and lifestyle issues, we have to start with biblical separation. And this is something that's not being taught in most churches out there today. I know because you guys are a lot, not you guys, I mean, the people I meet that claim to be Christians are more worldly than I was when I was trying to be a worldly Christian. When I was first told, well, just go ahead and do your thing and, and just as long as you come to church and praise God and, you know, pay some tithes, you're okay. That's serving God. Well, that's not Christianity. And so I, I fell into a worldly lifestyle and tried to run with the world up to limits. I couldn't sin with them, but I thought I could hang out with them, go dancing with them, that sort of thing. And that's not acceptable. We have to really deal with this issue of biblical separation to deal with the music issue. Because that's where it begins. It is a failure in the professing church today that these pastors that are, are not discipling you, not shepherding you, they're... If anything, they're leading you to the gates of hell because they're not discussing biblical separation. That's the sad thing is that some of you are hearing the words biblical separation, that term, here for the very first time. And that is, is an affront to God. That is disgusting and a shame to those who claim to be teachers and pastors for you. If you look like the world, you are considered part of the world. And I keep, I keep repeating that, and I constantly get the, these answers back that, that that's not the case, that you're wrong, no, 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 Or they completely ignore when I point out that if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, swims like a duck, it's a duck. They gloss over that. They miss the fact that I'm not talking 
foolishly, I'm quoting the Bible. You say, where? Let's look at John chapter 15, starting with verse 19. And I'm not going to give you one verse. I'm going to give you one verse here, and I'm going to give you more scriptures. I'm going to give you a little taste of my sermons on biblical separation here on this video. John 15, 19. If ye were of the world, the world would love you. I'm sorry. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Now this is the part, because people know this is true, they don't want to be persecuted in America, so they want to look like all their friends. With the same ungodly apparel, with the same ungodly music, with the same ungodly activities, with the same unbiblical practices. Because if they separate from their teen peers, you're going to get persecuted. You're going to get mistreated. Well, grow up. That's what Jesus said. He said he came to divide families with the truth, with the gospel. Let's go on to John chapter 17 to the follow-up to this. John chapter 17, verse 14. I have given them thy word. Now, he's praying to God the Father the, the, in the Godhead. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus says it twice to the Father in the Godhead, both of which knew this was true. And you wonder sometimes when we pray to God using his word, you say, well, he already knows his word. Well, that's still the point. Well, sometimes we need to hear it, but God knows his word. doesn't matter. He still, when you pray to him, he said, pray like this. And he, to, in praying amongst the Godhead, uses the, the truth and the knowledge they already all knew. Let's not stop there because we're laying a foundation for biblical separation. Number five, uh, ch uh, Matthew chapter 5, 13. Again, these are scriptures you should have already heard 10,000 times if you've been in church for more than five years. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now, if, if you're salt, that differentiates you from everyone. And the reason God uses salt here is salt is a disinfectant. It's a cleanser. We, we get the old saying, I, don't, I hate to pour salt in a wound, but that's what you do to cleanse a wound. You pour salt in it, and it burns, it hurts, it sears. And that's what he says we are. If you're a true born-again Christian, you are salt and reflecting the light of God which is also unwelcome in this dark world. Because in John, let's add on John 3.16, no. Everybody focused on John 3.16, no. John 17 through 22, where Jesus said, that's the, this for this the condemnation, that light has come into the world, but men rejected the light. Because why? He goes on to explain they want to hide their sin, so they run from the light. So when you're reflecting the light of God, you're automatically, you might as well be salt, because it's burning them. It's like vampires. They run from the light. They run from the truth. Therefore, you're not going to be loved by the world. So suck it up and get used to it. This is the path of Christianity. We are always a minority position. We are always persecuted for the gospel's sake. And we are always at enmity with the world. God said to be enmity with Christ is, is I mean, uh, uh, to be in unity with Christ is enmity with the world. You can't serve two masters. You see where we're going with this biblical separation? It's not so simple. You have to be different from the world. Let's go on. It's not all the scriptures. I mean, I can go on for days with biblical separation, even going back in the Old Testament and showing how God didn't want cotton and linen mixed in the same garment because he expects the purity. He didn't want his bread leavened in his, in his rites, such as communion and all, because it's a leavening of the, as he said, the leavening of the Pharisees, Leavening is puffing up. It's an extra contaminant to bread. The bread is not pure when you put leaven in it. It puffs it up. It fills it with empty air spaces, and God wants purity. And that's the sign of the believer. The fruits of the Spirit include the purity, the sanctification of the believer. But let's get back to the, ver the other scriptures. 
2 Corinthians 6 and 14. And in Corinthians, Paul's dealing with a devil of a lot of sin and the most vile wickedness that, I mean, stuff you can barely discuss in mixed company in church he had to answer in, in Corinthians. And this scripture got me in trouble one time. And it gets me in trouble regularly because this is a description that people misapply to marriage. Now, it doesn't have application to marriage. All marriages are fellowship, but all, my, all fellowship is not marriages. So this is applicable to, to marriage, but not solely to marriage. But people like to stick it on marriage so they can say, hey, I can do this other stuff and get away with it. Chapter 6, verse 14 of 2 Corinthians. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I'm going to repeat that. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Almighty God. Now, we can't take every Old Testament promise to the Jews and to the Israeli nation-state under God and apply them to ourselves. That's part of my most often misquoted series, is they want to pull promises God made to Israel and apply them to Christians. But when Paul, the greatest expositor of the Old Covenant to the New Covenant, the greatest expositioner in the whole Bible, tells you that a verse from the Old Testament applies to the New Covenant that we have with God and is equally applicable in the New Testament, it jolly well is equally applicable in the New Covenant. And what is this new? Is old. Let's repeat this. And what uh, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you. Now, the, what you don't get from that, some of you, is the implied, or you can infer from that the inverse. That is, if you touch the unclean thing, if you don't separate, he will not be your father. The being the father here explicitly is to those that come out from the world and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. You notice how Paul gave example after example. He didn't just say one little example. He goes on to say, you know, uh, what light and darkness. Then he goes on to point out that, hey, this is also that you're the temple of God. How can the temple of God be united with the temple of idols? So you see that he's driving this home. This is, there's no way to get away from this. This is the foundational scripture in discussing biblical separation. But for a lot of you that are sinners that have convinced yourself you're Christians or were told that simply because you made a decision, a conscientious decision one day to serve Jesus or to accept Jesus. I'm sorry, you're not even told that you have to serve and obey all his commandments. You're just told you could just accept Jesus as your personal savior and just go to heaven. Praise God. That's not scripture. That's not biblical. What is biblical is the bowing of the knee and surrendering your entire life to God and obeying all his commandments because he says, if you don't obey my commandments, you're not my children. If you don't follow me, take up my cross, you're not my children. If you follow your lusts, you're not my children. So you've got a big problem here claiming you're Christian when you haven't done those things, but right here, this scripture divides the wheat from the chaff. Let's go on in case you don't want to believe Paul. You know, you think you need another apostle to say something. Let's look at James. James pointed out the contradiction of lifestyle and the lack of separation in specific examples. In the short book of James, chapter 3, or letter from James, chapter 3, verse 9, we'll go to 13. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Now, let me interject something here for all you fools out here who keep not watching my video on the judge not lie. 
part of my most often misquoted series where I expose the fact that the judge, anybody that says judge not is a fool and a liar and probably, or totally uneducated, doesn't know Bible, and probably is not a Christian, because that's a diabolical lie. Only Satan doesn't want you to judge him. Right here, not only does, does this show judgment, it is very strict judgment. He says, and therewith we, and he, you have to read the verses before that he's going by the gospel and the proper judgment, but he says, therewith we curse we curse we men. He's saying we're cursing them, and that is judging them and pronouncing judgment upon them, that they are cursed and damned under the law because of what they do. Which are made, and these are men that were made after the likeness of God, after the similitude of God. Let's go on and read what else he says on this. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same time place sweet water and bitter water? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine fig, either a vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and endued with wisdom, I mean with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness and wisdom. And this, this even talks to me as times is getting angry and having to be careful and tone down my speech so as not to be railing with blessings and cursings out of the same mouth. But you see how he's delineating that there's a difference in a godly man and an ungodly man. That it's as Jesus even said when he was here, it's not what a man eats that damns him. It's because what a man eats goes out in the draft, but it's what comes out of a man's mouth that damns him because out of the fullness of the heart the mouth speaks. Let's go on on this issue of biblical separation. And again, I'm just hitting the high points. I could lecture for hours on biblical separation because there's different levels, different types. Paul explains that we're not only to separate for defense, but also for our reproof, for reproof of the people we're separating from. Because see, at no time are we saying you can't be friendly or friends with sinners. Jesus came and brought the gospel to the sinners. He sat there and ate with the publicans and the prostitutes, the tax collectors and prostitutes, the, the, the most known wicked people in, in Judaism at the time. And he sat with both and he gave them the gospel. But he did not tell us to go to the bars and the strip clubs and compel them to come in. He said highways and byways. But at the same time, we have to look at the fact that sometimes we have to separate from the sinners in their sin that they may be reproved of us that we say hey I'm sorry I can't go there you know I'll pray for you that God will that God will save you but you if you do that you're damned if you do that you're going to hell let's look at at what Paul says on on this in Ephesians 5 5 to 5 9 chapter 5 verses 5 through 9 for this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Now I'm constantly hearing about all this worldliness being accepted in the church. Let's hear from Paul, who judged people and told us to judge people and said, here is the criterion. Don't be fooled. If you're serving your lust, you're going to hell. Let's, li let's listen to this first verse again. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. He's separating them. Either you're obeying God or you're the children of disobedience. The children of disobedience are the damned, the sinners. They're going to hell. They cannot have any inheritance in the kingdom of God or Christ. For ye were sometimes darkness. But now ye are ye the light. Now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. How can you guys sit here and justify lust and sinfulness when the Word of God says explicitly that no whoremonger has a part in the kingdom? 
I'm dealing with people that consider themselves Christians that are shacking up. And I'm not talking about shacking up. You can be wed to a person and not churched, as the old Western said. You can be, when you're having sex with a woman, you're married to that woman. So you can be married, and, and we at the congregation have not endorsed that or acknowledged that union. But when, when I see couples having sex in the congregation where they're not openly reproved that, hey, we know you're married, you need to come forward and acknowledge that you're married and be faithful to this person, and they're continuing on where they're cohabitating in an unacknowledged marriage, or they're open marriage because they're out having sex with a bunch of people, but they're living with one guy, don't call that a don't call those people Christians. They're not Christians. There's a point at which you or you can be a Christian and be in disobedience. There's a point in open public stuff where Paul condemns in Corinthians, where you're not even a Christian. He even says, turn them over to the devil, turn their bodies over to the devil that their soul may be saved. But we're seeing this in there, and you had better learn biblical separations for yourself and practice biblical separation because these words will judge you. Not one yod nor dakot of this word will pass away until all be fulfilled. Let's go on in verses 10 through 14 in the same chapter 5 of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Prove, let's, let, let me read 9 again so you get the context. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Goodness and righteousness and truth is acceptable to the Lord. That's what we just read and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. This is where I was saying you can be friends with sinners, yes, but don't have anything to do with what they do. It says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. I've told my friends that are sinners, hey, dude, you, you got to stop that. God's not pleased. You're going to be judged for that. I don't just not go with them. I make sure I get an opportunity to tell them why I can't partake in that sin. And I warn them. If you love people, you warn them. Let's look at verse um, 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, which we're supposed to be the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. That's a call to repentance. Rise from death, awake, the, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you the light. This completely precludes the common statement that we hear, We don't want to offend anyone. If you ever hear, I've just given you scriptures from Paul that point blank say you better offend people and you better judge people. So if you're still holding to that lie, you're damned. You're going to hell. Because that is a damnable lie straight from Satan himself because the word of God, that is Antichrist, because the word of God says explicitly not only to judge, and Jesus said repeatedly to judge righteous judgment, but here Paul says we're to reprove their sins. We're to offend them. You've got to offend them. Why? Let's go back to what was said before. We're salt and light. Salt, Jesus said, for a reason, is because it's a cleaning, a disinfecting thing, a, a thing that burns when it's applied to a human being. And yet he said, you're salt. But if the salt, if you're salt, if you, you the salt, lose the savor, it's only good to be trodden to the foot of men. In other words, he points out that it's a cast away. If you're not salt to the world, you're not part of him. He will cast you away. And and if that isn't enough, let's look at 2 Timothy 4 and 2. You know, if I haven't put enough nails in these issues of biblical separation, in this coffin of using sinful music and sinful practices, or heathen, or pagan, or secular, or worldly practice in the church, let's add on what Paul says when Paul identifies anyone who would say that as being in it. Don't take it from Ken. Ken's nobody. Let's listen to what Paul says that just says what I did. That... Uh, that Anyone who would say that is, as a diabol is, a diabol is a diabolical liar, he said this directly to, to Timothy. 2 Timothy 4 and 2. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Let me say that again. 
Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. If your pastor says from the pulpit, judge not. If your pastor says from the pulpit, don't tell sinners they're sinning. Don't reprove people. He is a satanic liar. He doesn't deserve to be in the pulpit. He is a hireling from hell itself. Get rid of that man. If he is somehow so incompetent that he is just a liar and he's simply in there and doesn't have the knowledge to be a pastor, that's fine. Maybe he's not a direct employee of Satan. But either way, he's incompetent to be there. He's a liar and a charlatan because he doesn't know the foundational word of God. And I'm going to repeat this again because the Bible, when Jesus says something three times, it's like swearing an oath. And he says certain things three times for that reason. Let me read this a third time for that very reason to show that this is a lie and to bring this home to you. That, that anyone that contradicts this is a liar because Paul said he's a liar. Preach the word, be instant in season. Out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. If you're not reproving and rebuking sin, you're not a Christian. So no more lies on this. I'm sick of this. As I point out in the video, the judge not lie, we're commanded to upset and offend people. There's no getting around it. You have to tell the sinner they're sinning. And I don't mean to beat them over the head. Paul says in another verse, you know, or is it James? It says, you know, don't, don't overly condemn the sinner because they're already condemned of themselves. So he's basically saying, you know, when you are condemning their sins, do it in a, in a loving way. Do it in a way where they understand that it's a warning that you're trying to pull them out of a burning building, that you're not over there beating them with a, with a stick saying, stay in the hot fire and the, burns, the building's going to come down around you. No, we're, we're reaching in to pull them out. We're firefighters for Christ. We're pulling them out of the fires, which is explicitly said in Scripture. This issue of music is passionate to people because it is a lust and a passion issue. When you're touching music, you're touching an emotional passion issue. Lust issue. It's not a simple lifestyle. It's not about not eating meat offered to idols. It's not an issue of don't lie, don't steal. You know, something that's obvious that everybody knows is wrong. We're, we, you may not lust in your heart to steal. But music is a, a sensual thing. It's like the sexual issue. It's like sex. So when you touch music, you're touching something that's like sex. It's very sensual. It's very passion-based. It's very. It's it's really lustful. It, it it appeals to the 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 human nature and lusts. I can make you cry with a song. I can make you march with a song. I can make you beat the drums and get excited and get happy. I watch minister. Well, preachers. They're not ministers. They're just they're they're hirelings. Go in there and pump a service up using music to manipulate the people's emotional status just to get them to go along with wrongdoing. If you don't believe me, watch TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, all these other charlatan networks full of hirelings and watch how they use music to whip a crowd into frenzy and while they're in a frenzy, give us money. Let, let me wrap this up and again this is only maybe this much I mean tiny little bit of biblical separation. Just the, the, just scratching the surface of biblical separation because there are various levels and layers and, and things in, in regard to biblical separation. But this is you too. I, I can't get too long-winded. I may have already lost some of you viewers by now. But let's, let's, let's wrap this up with Paul's exhortation and it comes with a warning. He exhorts and he warns the Philippians in chapter 3. And I want to read pretty much the whole chapter. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the, the same things to you to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof to that he might where whereof he might trust in the flesh I more 
circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. Let me read that verse again. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable, conformable unto his death. If by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained it, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which, ap, that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Let me repeat that. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting, forgetting those things which are behind, the things, all things, the things he counts as dung, leaving which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I, and this is the most quote of Paul, the most greatest quotation of Paul, one of my favorites. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I know of no better way to wrap up and put the last nails in the coffin of, of biblical separation between us and the world and their music and everything else. Paul can't have put it more aptly. He can't have put it more directly where you can understand it. He said, I count all things loss. I consider them all to be dung. Then he further says, I forget those things I left behind. And the one thing I do, I press for the mark of the prize of the mark of the high calling of God. The highest thing we can attain to is the mark of the high calling of God. That's what you press toward. And according to Paul, all things you have to leave behind and you have to be willing to leave behind, lest you forget the rich young ruler who gave up heaven, who gave up fellowship with God because he was rich and he'd have to give up everything. And Jesus told him, you have to give, give it all away. He knew that that was the impediment, that, that, was, that his God was his money, his possessions. Paul says, I left it all behind, everything, and it's all done. I don't care about it anymore. I forget it. If you're still stuck on the music issue and you're still trying to drag your old worldly music into the house of God with you so you don't have to give it up, you're in disobedience to God. You're not in a place, because see, he said he wanted to be brought conformable to the death of Christ and the resurrection. That is, when we die and are resurrected in this life as born-again Christians, the old man is dead. The lust die, should die with him. We have to fight them daily to keep above it. We don't try to drag our old sins into our new walk with God, our new life as a born-again creature. Old things are passed away. Paul said, all, all things are, are lost for me, for the sake of Christ. I consider them all dung. This is where you need to be. This is where I need to be. And trying to drag the world's filth into the church just because you can't get a handle on your lusts is wrong. And we, I've given you an argument here that Jesus said that his prayer to him is not to be like the heathen. 
Now, he was just talking about the heathen, worldly, uh, the pagan and heathen religious stuff. Imagine his condemnation. He didn't even bother to condemn the sin of the world, the sinner's stuff, the sinner's practices. He was merely condemning the religious practices of the world. Either way, when you try to drag them in the church, there's no excuse. I gave you the argument at the beginning. You're welcome to try to challenge it, but you, you're not going to do it. One last thing, having gone full circle with what Paul pressed for what we should, I'm going to give you the, the, the premises and the argument one more time. And this is what you should answer or either accept this teaching as biblical. By definition, premise one, by definition, all praise of God is prayer. Premise number two, Jesus says not to pray to him like the heathens do. Therefore, heaven, a heathen music cannot be used to pray to God. And heathen practices cannot be used to praise God. There are restrictions on godly music. And vain repetitions is... Dis, uh, the choruses being sung and the vain repetitions and the la 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 and the praise 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 and I believe 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 all that is condemned he said that's pagan and I don't want it in there it's heathen I don't want it in there with their much speaking that they're much speaking repetitions I'll hear them no I already know what you need before you ask so just talk to me I'm your daddy I'm your Abba father I want to be your Abba daddy talk to me like that don't sit here just repeating yourself and if that's not good enough here our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and glory, forever and ever. Amen. He gives us the specific way to talk to him in a formal style and an informal style. And this is what we're supposed to do. You cannot disregard all the other commandments for biblical separation in God's word and just misquote David and say, hey, let's take two lines out of two of his songs and we're going to change the Bible and disregard all the other things where Paul and James and John and Jude and Jesus, God himself incarnate, called for biblical separation, called for separation from the world, separation from sin, separation from wrongdoing, separation from paganism and heathenism, and told us to judge, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering, and doctrine. That's what I've given you today is doctrine and teaching. If you want to post a counter-argument, it better be scriptural, but you're not going to. You're not going to disprove this. It's a syllogism. That's why I use a syllogism. Because it's it's the conclusion is true. It, it, if you want to attack my logic, I'll hear that, but you're not going to find a flaw in there. It's time for the church to clean up our act and look like God's church. Because if you look like the world, you are the world. So, for those of you that already know this is true, that are already suffering persecution, may the strength and blessing of God and the power of the Holy Spirit carry you throughout this day as you stand as salt and light to the world and stand on the Holy Word of God. May the blessing of the Holy Spirit be upon you and His strength carry you and He be strong in you and bless you. For those of you that are under condemnation now, that are upset with what I've said, that are disagreeing with what I've said, may God save you from your sins and may He bring you into the light of His truth. May God save and protect His church until His glorious return.